I mean to. Good morning. Welcome to Foundation Church. I'm trying not to move the uh, musician's mic stand here, so I guess I'll bend at the knees. But welcome. We're so glad you guys are here worshiping with us. And uh, just wanted to run a quick couple of announcements this morning. Uh, first one, I have to just say it uh, to everybody, but we got some new Foundation Church t-shirts this week. So if you are new here or you haven't gotten one because we were out last week, uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, at the table in the back, we've got some t-shirts. They're all, all adult sizes, but we'd love for you to take one and have that be our gift to you and uh, just welcome you to Foundation Church and that you uh, rock this scripture that God, Jesus is our only foundation and just wear that around town. It's a good conversation starter, right? Why are you wearing that? Who's Jesus? I'd love to tell you about him. Let's, let's sit down. Uh, anyway, a couple quick announcements to, uh, if you'd like to connect with Foundation Church, get more information. Uh, you got a prayer request, you want to sit down and talk to pastor, which is me, uh, here is the phone number that you can text, Nathan, there we go, if you could text to uh, 808-460-6564 and just put the words connect in that uh, text block there and it'll send you a response to, that you can fill out and, and send back and we will contact you as soon as possible. Uh, we want to... Again, that's anything you want to know about us. You got any questions? You got any prayer requests? Just can connect to that phone number. Uh, also, if you'd like to give online to Foundation Church, you can do that to that same phone number. Just text the word "giving" to 808-460-6564. And uh, after Dave announced this last week and kind of made fun of my Hawaiian phone number, I got to got to explain it a little bit. We use two different texting uh, apps that are. Nationwide church built apps and they don't have a phone number for Alaska. I don't know what's up with that But they have one for Hawaii. So I said if I can't be in Alaska in January, where would I rather be? <laughs> Hawaii, so we got a Hawaiian phone number um, So text that number and we will get in contact with you uh, Next uh, youth on Wednesday night at 630 we're meeting right here and we've started a new study this past Wednesday night We are going through a study called fully devoted uh, it's in the Bible app so that we can work along all week together through it and, and sharpen one another and keep each other accountable. Uh, so that would be Wednesday night at 6.30 right here for all you youths. Or if you feel like a youth, come on out. That's fine. We can worship together. Um, and then lastly, tonight at 5.45, we're going to start meeting again as our launch team core group together. We haven't met since we started here in November. We took a little break. Uh, but now we're going to ramp that back up. And so if you weren't a part of that initial core team, but yeah, you feel like Foundation Church is a place where you want to plug in and serve and be a part of and, and help us build outward as we prepare to launch in April, uh, man, you can come be a part of that tonight at 545. Uh, Dr. Jim Hamilton is going to come tonight and, and give us some, some uh, a good word and some encouragement as far as church planting uh, and what that looks like. So that will be tonight at 545. Here. That'll be right here. Mall closes at 6, so if you come in after 6, you got to come in the back door. But 5.45, we'll meet right here, and then we'll exit out the back door when it's over. Um, so yeah, with that being said, let me pray for us, and then we'll get our worship started. And uh, then I'll sit down because Daniel Marr is preaching today. So we got to let, my, let our elder do his work and bring God's word today. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for this space that you've given us in the mall to where we can glorify you, worship you, and just proclaim your word. And we're so thankful for you, uh, for your son Jesus, and for your Holy Spirit. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would just come in today and join with us and meet with us and uh, ignite our hearts aflame for your love and for your goodness. And as we sing these words, Lord, don't just let them be words on a screen and words out of our mouth, but let them be shouts of praise to you because you are worthy of our greatest praise. 
We thank you, Father. We say it all in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. All right, let's stand if you feel like standing. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. And I just want to, okay, so this morning we're starting out our worship uh, set list with My Lighthouse. Anybody familiar with that song? It is, uh, it is Jonathan's favorite song, which is why he's up here this morning. And so I wanted to invite any kiddos, or actually really any of you, Sam, you know, I, I know you love this song, right? So I <laughs> If you want to come to the front, if you want to come stand on the stage, you want to come sing with us, please do so. Because I know this is one of the songs we've often sang. And that we, it's fine. So you can, <laughs> and so, yes, Deacon, come on. And we're going to sing this song this morning.
Thank you so much. I just love that so much. You know, these kids are our future. You know, one day I'm not going to be standing here, and one day Miss Karina's not going to be on the keys and, you know, down the line. Well, you're not as old as me. So, <laughs> you know, these kids are our future, and these youth are our future. And so we have to raise up little worshipers, right? And we all worship something. Who, what are we going to worship? You know, are we going to worship God? Are we going to worship ourselves? Are we going to worship what the world tells us to worship? You know, no, we want to we want to create this culture and help raise up this generation of worshipers who love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. There is no other so sure and steady my hope is held in your
Psalms 90. Lord, you have been our refuge in every generation. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity, you are God. You return mankind to the dust, saying, Return, descendants of Adam. For in your sight a thousand years are like yesterday that passes by, like a few hours of the night. You end their lives, they sleep. They are like grass that grows in the morning, in the morning it sprouts and grows, by evening it withers and dries up. For we are consumed by your anger, we are terrified by your wrath. You have set our unjust ways before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days ebb away under your wrath, we end our years like a sign. Our lives last 70 years, or, if we are strong, 80 years. Even the best of them are struggle and sorrow. Indeed, they pass quickly and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger? Your wrath matches the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days carefully, so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. Lord, how long? Turn and have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your faithful love so that we may shout with joy and be glad all our days. Make us rejoice for as many days as you have humbled us, for as many years as we have seen adversity. Let your work be seen by your servants and your splendor by their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be on us. Establish us for the work of our hands. Establish the work of our hands. For the day. 
Father, I just thank you so much, God, for everybody who's here this morning. God, I pray that before our hearts give up, Lord, satisfy us every morning, God, when we wake up. Let your name be on our lips. And before we go to bed at night, thanking you, God, for all that you've done for us. <laughs> we thank you, Father, for this time. We thank you for our brother in Christ, Daniel, who's going to bring the message this morning. We love you, and we give praise to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As a sign that your prayer was too long. It's like, right, I'm cutting you off. <laughs> I'm cutting you off. Good morning, church. How are you today? Good. Response is okay here at Foundation Church. We like it. It's okay. How are we? Good. All right. That's good. All right. There you go. Thank you, Pastor Roy. Thank you, uh, worship team, for that. That was a beautiful uh, worship set. Um, my name is Daniel. For those of you who don't know me, I actually see quite a few faces I don't know here today, which is pretty awesome. So I'm one of the elders here at Foundation Church and uh, going to give Roy a break this morning because he does a lot of work here at the church and does a lot of sermon prep. And so we're giving him a Sunday to sit back and uh, enjoy or not enjoy. We'll see what happens. But um, when Amy reached out to me earlier this week, it was funny to... Um, I thought it was really awesome, but she reached out and said, hey, I heard that you're speaking on Sunday, so I'm working on the worship set. You know, do you have any songs that you want played? So I was like, yeah, I'll send you a playlist. Uh, Skillet, Thousand Foot Crutch, Demon Hunter, Decipher Down, right? All my heavy metal Christian bands that I listen to. And weirdly, none of them made the set, so I don't know if maybe she didn't get the text. Maybe she needs to get her phone worked out, but... Um, no, while it's true that I love that music, I've always loved heavy metal, I still do, I like Christian metal music, what I really love is music, okay? And it's interesting, but I truly feel that's a gift that God gave humans, right? We respond to music differently than animals do, for example. And my daughter Eleanor, who's sick this morning, normally she would be right here dancing around, right? At two years old, she might not know every word and every lyric and the meaning behind all these songs, but something in her stirs her heart when she hears music. And she's worshiping and she's moving and she's praising her creator. So I love music. I love all styles of music that worship the Lord, whether that be metal or even rap or um, not country. No country music is good. Um, but, uh, okay, there's like one song that's good, okay? Um, but I just love music that worships and glorifies our God. And did we not do that this morning, right? That was awesome. So thank you, Amy. And thank you, Matt and Natalie and Karita. I'm making an executive decision here, and I hope I don't get fired for this, but that's in my way. So um, what I want you guys to do to get ready this morning, if you've never heard me speak before, we're going to do a little exercise that's going to help you be more comfortable, okay? So I want everyone to do this, and now this, now look to your left, right, now we're all, all around. Do that a couple times, and you'll be stretched and loose because I move around a lot, all right? So if you're not stretched, you're going to get really exhausted trying to follow me, okay? How, where are my other uh, cell phone walkers? Who can't talk on a phone without moving? Am I the only one? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I was like, there's got to be more, right? I mean, literally, nothing would be worse than an interrogative torture device to me than we're going to strap you to this chair, you can't move, and you got to have a 15-minute phone conversation. My head would explode. Right. And so if you guys ever call me and I text you back, it's probably because I'm in a confined space. I don't have the room to talk to you. I have the time to talk to you. I just don't have the space to talk to you. Right. So I'm going to text you back and I speak the same way. So I'm going to be moving a lot. That's just what I do. Um, real quick, we're going to recap before we jump into Galatians chapter three. The book of Galatians, if you've not enjoyed it already, you're going to find is an awesome um, book. It's an awesome letter from Paul. It has a lot of relevance to the church today. And that's why, well, I don't know exactly why, but I think that's why Roy chose to start with Galatians as we went through our expository um, sermon series here at Foundation Church. And last week, Roy finished up chapter two. So if you guys recall, chapter two, what was the last thing he talked about in the latter half of that chapter was Paul confronting who? Do you remember? You could say it's okay. What, Claire? Somebody said it. Did you have it, Claire? Well, Paul was confronting Peter. I heard somebody say Peter, right? And do you guys remember the nature of that confrontation? Did Paul enjoy it? Was he happy about it? What was said about the confrontation? Do you remember? He was acting Yes, absolutely. That's why he was confronted, right? But how, how did Paul respond to the confrontation? He wasn't really happy to do it. Right, he said he had to, right? You remember that? He said, I had to confront Peter, right? 
And it's interesting because that's a, that's a really significant point because it's not like, because we're going to see this as we get into Galatians chapter 3, you're like, man, Paul's kind of a bad guy. He's really not. He's acting biblically and he's acting on his convictions. But he had to confront Peter because he's doing Jacob? Dustin. Dustin, man. He's doing exactly what Dustin, and recognize the face, doing exactly what Dustin said. And, you know, Peter was acting one way when he was with his traditional Jewish friends and he was acting another way when he was with his Gentile friends. And Peter said, or Paul said, nope, can't have that. So he said, I had to confront him, okay? So Paul's rebuke, this is the thing. It seemed kind of harsh, but a really important thing. And as we go into chapter 3, you need to get this right now. Paul's rebuke was firm, but it was biblically backed, okay? Paul was able to back that up. The latter half of chapter 2, in the last couple verses, he says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is not longer, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless, for if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die and drop mic or whatever they used in 47 AD. Probably not a mic. But seriously, is that not a drop mic moment? Think about how awful the torture and the punishment that our Savior went through. And he's saying, if you're going to do this, then he died for no reason. That meant nothing. That was a powerful statement. All right, so that's how Paul finishes up chapter 2. Moving into Galatians chapter 3, this morning what we're going to do is we're going to look at verses 1 through 14. And then next week, uh, uh, Pastor Rory is going to pick it up and finish out the chapter. So what I did here is I broke down these first 14 verses into um, four sections. Hey, my slide is up there. Cool. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I sent that to Roy. I wasn't sure what it was going to look like, so he made it work. Um, so we're going to break this down into four different sections, okay? And starting with verse 1 and the first section, which is rebuke. So once again, Paul starts chapter 3 with a rebuke. So let's look at verse 1. He says, O foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. So let's think about that statement for a second. We read that and we're like, oh, okay, yeah, whatever. Oh, foolish Galatians. That's a powerful statement. The Apostle Paul is literally starting chapter 3 saying, you guys are acting like a bunch of idiots. <laughs> That's what he's saying. It sounds harsh, but let's think about it for a second, okay? Because I'm using the NLT today, so if you want to follow the same version I'm following... I prefer the NLT, the New Living Translation. Some of your translations, though, actually use the word stupid or senseless Galatians. And the word foolish that he uses here, the, the word that foolish that Paul is using, is a Greek word antios, which means unintelligible or unwise. Now let's think about that for a second. There's a difference between unintelligible and unintelligent. Okay, Unintelligible is literally a misunderstanding. Okay? So what Paul is saying here is, you guys are being so silly, I can't even comprehend you, right? Or in our modern English language, what we might say is this, I can't even fathom that thought. Have you ever heard that? Right? Have you ever been in an argument? Not, I'm not suggesting anybody here argues with their spouse. I certainly never have. But in a strictly hypothetical scenario, if you were to argue with your spouse, could you get in a scenario where you're like, I can't even fathom what you're saying. It's not sinking in, right? That's what Paul is saying to the Galatians here. This is so silly, so off the wall, doesn't even make any sense to me. I don't, have a, I don't have a response to this. And then he continues in verse 1 asking if somebody puts a spell on them. Okay, so this word spell is the Greek word baskiano, which means to be bewitched by evil. So why do you think he threw that in there? I think it's because he's making another point. He's saying this is so off the wall, are you crazy? Is something wrong with you? Right, that's what he's saying. Again, in modern day English, right? If someone's talking to me and they're saying something way off the wall, and they're like, are you high right now? Right? That's, that's, that's how that would translate today, right? Are you on medication? Something's making you not think properly, right? And that's what Paul's saying here. Are you, are you under some kind of spell? Because the things you're saying do not line up with what you know is true. So now we have to, we recognize the fact that Paul in chapter three starts out swinging, right? I mean, he comes out of the gate throwing punches here, does he not? So we've got to ask ourselves, why is that? Is Paul just a bad guy? I mean, Amy, I'm trying to stay. Like, I know the future stage is the tape, so I'm trying to practice. But, man, I'm going to be walking on the floor because <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. All right. So Paul comes out of the gate swinging. And we have to ask ourselves, why is he so upset? Is this guy just a bad guy? Has he just got anger issues? Does he need to go to anger management? What's the deal? So let's think about that for a second. Is he being harsh? 
We need to consider our audience for just a minute. And for this, we're going to go all the way back to when we started Galatians in mid-December. Okay, so we're going to ask the kids again. Roy did this last week. So how many kids by physical age, not maturity age, um, how many kids, uh, how about 12 and under, can tell me where was Paul from? Do you guys remember that? No. Anybody else know? Tar, he's got it. He's got it. Close. Tars, do you guys remember that one? Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus, right? You guys remember that one? It's coming back. We're going to ask you next week, okay? All right, so he's talking here in chapter 2. So this is Paul, the converted Paul. And here he's talking to the, this, this book he wrote to Galatians, this letter, okay? It's important to note that he's talking to the Galatian churches, okay? Plural. It's most widely accepted by biblical scholars that in this book, Paul is addressing about five churches in the southern region of Galatia. That he planted on his first missionary journey. Okay? So that's very significant. Because what happens is after Paul plants these churches, they kind of went off the deep end. So now we have to consider what's Paul's role in this book. What's the purpose of his letter? And the purpose of his letter is correction and instruction. Right? This is not a, hey, how's it going? Dax, good to see you, buddy, letter. Right? This is not a, you know, Jack, how's things going over there at the bike shop? No, this is a, hey, you guys are messing up and we need to talk about it. Okay, And the reason for that is Paul learns after he departed from planting these very churches that false teachers had moved into the churches and they're being pressured um, to still hold up the Mosaic law. So they were claiming heavily that circumcision was still required to be accepted by Christ. These, these people were claiming that there, there was a, a barrier between Jew and Greek and only one race was still accepted by Christ. And then they were also taking and discrediting Paul. So they were going in and saying, hey, everything he told you, it's a lie. Don't listen to it. And Paul gets word of this. So he's like, I need to deal with that. Now, the interesting thing here for me is that I did quite a bit of research trying to nail down a date. And it's debated, but it seems pretty widely accepted that the letter to the Galatians was written about one to maybe two years after he planted those churches. So it didn't take them that long to kind of go off the rails, did it? So now that we realize what he's addressing here, let's put that in today's context. Let's think about Foundation Church for a minute. This church is a plant, is it not? Were we sitting on sheetrock buckets like a few months ago, right? It's been amazing to watch God work in this place. But this is a plant, okay? And it started with a vision and a tugging and a burden that God placed on Roy and Amy's hearts to plant this church, right? We're still shooting for our April uh, is Easter in April? I think so. We're still shooting for our Easter public launch date to be officially open as a church, right, to the public. So let's say we get there, and let's say a year later, let's say summer of 24, right, Pastor Roy comes to me and says, you know what, it's time for us to go plant elsewhere. To which I would say, one, you're dead to me, and two, how can I help you, right? Okay, because we know that's going to happen, church, and I make that joke, but it's a beautiful thing. At the moment Roy and Amy say we're ready to go plant again, that's a good thing. It's going to be sad. But it's a good thing. But let's say that happens next summer, right? Summer of 24. And let's say by December of 24, they're in a new church somewhere. Now, in Paul's day, he probably got word what was happening at the Galatian churches via letter or somebody on foot telling him. But today, it would just be easy to look on Facebook, right? So Roy and Amy go plant another church. It's December of 24. And they're looking at Facebook and they're watching a message where, um, hopefully not me, but somebody's preaching. And they're preaching heresy in the church that they helped plant. How would that feel, Roy? You wouldn't like it very much, would you? And I can tell you guys, I know Pastor Roy pretty well. He would not say, oh, yeah, well, we were involved in that plant, but, you know, water under the bridge, I, no worries, whatever. No. Even though he's no longer at the church, Roy has an ownership there, right? Every pastor does. A pastor's responsibility is to shepherd the sheep, right? To protect them, to look out for them. And so if Pastor Roy, a year after planting this church, found out that we're teaching stuff that's not biblical, he'd be pretty upset, right? And he would have reason, hopefully, thank you, exactly. And he would have every reason to, to write a letter, or in this case, probably a text, right? If I got a handwritten letter, I'd be like, man, I really messed up. If I got a handwritten letter in 2023, right? Okay, but that's, what, that's the situation Paul is in right here, right? He planted the church, they're going off the rails, and he's like, I have to address this. Okay, so verses 2 through 5. So verse 1, he starts off just, man, I'm going to hit you hard, right? Right, right in the jaw. Now verses 2 through 5, he goes into the challenge phase. So let's read through this, verse 2. 
Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. So I love how Paul sets this up. Because first he gets their attention with their rebuke, right? But then he goes in to explain himself on why he's so upset. He doesn't just land blast and then, all right, that's it. Let her close. No, now he's going to explain himself. In these first five verses, he makes a profound point that's important to all of us as believers. Okay, so what Paul is trying to instill here is that while, yes, we are saved by grace, right? We are saved by faith in Christ. It does not stop there. We also live our lives through the gospel, right? The gospel is alive and living within us. So it's a process for salvation, the faith in Christ, but then it's a process for sanctification as well, right? The big word that says trying to become more Christ-like throughout our Christian walk, okay? So we don't just begin our Christian, Christian walk by faith and then grow our works or legalism, in this case the law. If these terms don't make sense, if these are the first time you've heard either one of these, I'll explain real quick. So the law, what they were getting hung up on was... The, the old Jewish ways, if you will, that said you have to do things a certain way, that Christ died on a cross for to remove that restriction, okay? And I use the word legalism because that's probably what more applies today in today's church, okay? It's not likely, I mean, maybe, but it's not likely we're going to have somebody come into foundation and say, I'm putting my foot down on this cultural circumcision practice they're talking about here. Or I'm going to say you can't walk a certain distance on Sunday, Right? We're probably not going to have somebody get caught up on that, but we could easily have somebody get caught up on legalism. And I grew up in a church in the South, churches, um, I grew up in an area called the Bible Belt. And churches were very legalistic there. So you had to go past five or six churches to get to your church, and sometimes your church shared a parking lot with the church across the street. There was that many churches. And this church would say you have to dress this way, and that church would say you have to dress this way, and that church would say you have to play this music, and that church would say no hats, no long hair, no pants, ladies, and all these different things that are not part of the gospel. Okay, So that's kind of what it looks like in today's age, and there was no place for it in the Galatian church, and there's no place for it in this church. So Paul is saying remove it, get it out of the church, be done with it, period. It's not welcome here. Okay? He finishes by reiterating that fact that we're not only justified by the gospel, but we're sanctified through it as well. So now he moves into verse 6 through 9, the application phase, I call this. He hits them hard. He asks them a few clarifying questions in those last five verses, right? Which was cool because now he's asking them questions to get them to realize what they're doing. You ever done that with your kids? Did that make any sense what you just did? Right? That's what he's doing. He's getting them, he's trying to, to, to get their brain thinking, right? Well, now he moves into making it practical to that church. And this is really cool what he does right here in verses 6 through 9. Let's read this together. In the same way, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures look forward to this time when God would declare the Gentiles to be righteous because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, All nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because, not because of his, not because of his heritage or his culture, because of what? Say it with me. His, his faith. Right? The point Paul is trying to hammer home. So look back at verse 6 here. Is that still up there? If you go back to verse 6, Nathan, please. Notice that Paul uses Abraham here, and we have to ask ourselves why. Let's think about that for a second, because it's pretty crafty. Most of the issues that were coming up in the Galatian church here were coming from what we'll call old school Jews, right? So they were trying to stick to the old traditions, the old culture, okay? Now, in the Jewish faith, just like in our faith, Abraham is a very important character. He's a key player, okay? And he's highly revered and respected. Yet, Abraham had faith in who? Say it loud. We're going to get there. Somebody said it quiet. Say it loud. Abraham had faith in God. Thank you. Okay? So what Paul's doing here is it's pretty awesome. 
He's taking somebody that they hold in reverence, the very people that are causing these problems. He's taking somebody that they respect and say, hey, I'm not making this up. The very person that you have this utmost respect for is doing exactly what I'm telling you to do. And he's placing his faith in God, right? Check out verse 7 through 9. The Jews also considered themselves the true children of Abraham. So that's how they saw themselves. They saw themselves as the, the actual or the real descendants. Okay? But Paul's trying to make the point that, I'm sorry guys, um, but you kind of got that part wrong too. Because go back one, Nathan. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. So he's like, whoops, you missed that one too, guys. Sorry. And I love how he starts verse 8, Nathan. What's more? Because what he's saying here is, oh, and another thing, <laughs> right? Is that not what he's saying? Go back to the hypothetical argument that you would never have with your spouse, right? And you get on a hypothetical roll and you're like, and one more thing, right? And that's what Paul's saying right here. He's like, by the way, here's one other thing that you missed. The scriptures looked forward to this time. We would call that a prophecy. Thank you. I heard it from over here. The scriptures looked forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. So I love that when he's like, and one more thing. Let me throw this one at you. And now let's look at verse 9. Paul's explaining that this precious claim the Jews were holding on to, that they were the true children of Abraham and have this blessing, they have it misunderstood. Because all who place their faith in the God of Abraham share Abraham's blessing. Right? Big difference. Right? Big difference. All right, the last four verses. Paul moves into what I call the clarification stage. So he hit them hard. He asked them some questions. He made it very relevant to their church and their culture at the time. And now he's going to tie it all together. Let's start in verse 10. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of law. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. This way of faith is very different from the way of the law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoings. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing, Jews, the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Paul's doing something awesome here. If he wasn't doing this, I don't think we'd be reading about Paul because I think he'd be out of context. But what he's doing here is he's quoting scripture. Right? We're not going to go turn to it, but when he says um, back in verse uh, 10, Nathan, sorry, I know I'm making you click around, buddy. You're doing great. You're killing it. You're killing it. All right. When he says, curse is everyone who does not observe and obey the commandments that are written in God's book, he's quoting Deuteronomy right there. Okay. And it's awesome because he's, he's bringing that up to point out the fact that the law was a curse. The law was a tool to point us towards God to show us that we need a savior to prove that we cannot uphold it. It's impossible. Nobody's going to uphold the law and not sin, right? No, not one. Remember that verse? Okay. We can't do it. Only Christ lived the sinless life. And then he made that atonement for us when he hung on the cross and got rid of that curse. So what's interesting here, and the reason I say it's so cool that Paul's doing this is he's not, he's like, I'm not pulling this out of nowhere, man. This is in the scriptures, right? Here it is. Now, think about this. The Galatians are reading this letter, right? They're, they're sitting in their chair. They're like me pacing back and forth. And they're reading this letter for the first time. Okay? But Paul's doing exactly what we're doing today. Right? He's preaching to them. And he's quoting scripture to do it. We're just now using this letter. We skipped a few generations, right? But that's what he's doing to prove to them that, hey, I'm not making this up. Look, guys, it's right here. The very word that you believe says it. Verse 11 through 13, if you can throw those up there, Nathan. Again, quoting Deuteronomy. But now he jumps in and he's quoting Habakkuk and Leviticus. Paul's reaffirming what the law was and how it differs through faith in Christ. He's not denying it existed. 
He's not trying to twist it, but he's saying you misunderstood the purpose and you greatly misunderstood what Christ did for you on the cross. You really messed that one up, guys. That's what he's saying here. Verse 14. Paul's now looking at this mixed crowd of Jew and Gentile. And again, he's wrapping it all up to say, you guys are 100% equal in faith through Christ. Period. Drop the act. End of discussion. Can we start acting like a church now? Right? That's what he's saying. You guys are equal. Drop it. It's time to be a body of believers. And then let's do this thing. Okay? So... We'll close up with this for a few minutes. That's Paul and his letter to the Galatian churches, right? In chapter 3, we see that he rebukes them. He gets them thinking. He applies it to their culture. He ties it all together. So now we want to do that same piece for just a minute, okay? Roy talked last week about expository preaching. Remember what that meant? We were supposed to... Anybody remember what Roy said? We're supposed to pull it out of the word, right? Exposit. Is that what it means? To take it out, right? Yeah. Okay. We're supposed to take it out, right? And then we don't just like set it over here. No, we apply it, right? So that's the expository preaching. So we want to know, okay, I feel like I did an okay job at explaining how it was practical to the Galatian church, right? What Paul was trying to get across to them. But now we need to see, does this apply to foundation church? Natalie's not in here lecturing me about eating with different people groups, Right? Matthew's not lecturing me about walking a certain distance on Sundays, right? We don't have people in here trying to keep us under Old Testament law. So how does this apply to our church? Do you think that we at Foundation Church could easily fall under the exact same temptation and sin the Galatian church did? Not rhetorical. Do you think so? Absolutely, right? Now, if you don't want to um, self, you know, you don't want to discriminate yourself. I'll use myself for example for a minute, okay? And then you can be thinking about your own life. Um, when my wife and I moved up here 10 years ago now, just over 10 years ago, we originally came here as missionaries. And we spent three years doing that full time. Now, obviously, every one of us that's a believer should be a missionary. I don't want to confuse that statement. But what I mean is we were doing it vocationally, right? That was our full time job. And it, within that organization, there was things going on there that I knew were not right, Okay. I knew there were some issues that needed to be kind of hammered out. And I kind of put up with them for a while and a while. And long story short, at the end, when I finally got away from that ministry, and then years later, as I counsel other people who have gone through that same thing, I told them the one mistake that I made was staying within that way too long. I knew that this was not biblical, and I was stuck. So then I had to ask myself as a mid-20s at the time, why was that? Right? Why did I allow myself to get stuck in that rut? And it took me quite a while. I mean, literally, guys, probably in the last few years to finally realize it was because I was attaching my ministry to my faith. I was making my ministry a requirement for my faith, for my salvation, for the gospel. I was doing the exact same thing the Galatian church was doing by putting the law between me and Christ. I was putting my ministry there, right? I was saying, well, yes, I know that technically this probably is not right or it's a great area, but it's all for the greater good, so it's okay, right? Here's another one. You write a check. Well, nowadays, do you know what a check is, people under 20? You guys know how to write checks? Seriously. Do you? Okay. You know what a check is? Okay, good. All right. Well, we don't use them a lot is my point, okay? You, do you, who remembers writing a check to get cash out, Right? Hey, I'm going to go on a date. I'm going to write a check, get cash out, go to the movie theater. Okay, yeah, exactly. So we don't do that anymore. Um, But if you donate money to the church or a ministry or whatever, how about could that creep in real easy? Could that get in there and say your your level of sanctification and faith is dependent by how much you give to the church? Whether that be finances or, wait a second, for those of you who are like, I don't have money, not a problem. Let me hit you with this. How about your time? Ouch. Daniel, that hurt. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. It's kind of fun. Um, But seriously, right? If you think, no, I don't struggle with the money issue, but do you ever feel like if I don't give enough to God, I don't get his full grace, right? Whether or not you're going to admit that's how you feel, that creeps in. It's very easy to do. It's a tactic of Satan. It's the exact same thing that was happening to the Galatian church. So that's where we as a church, foundation church, have to be careful 
and have to remember, oh man, Roy, we need our sign, man. I'm trying to point to foundation. Um, that's where we have to be careful and remember our foundation, right? And it stops at the gospel. And that, that's Paul's whole point. Really, in the whole book of Galatians, sorry to give the rest of the book away, but especially in chapter 3, that's it. He's like, Jesus, cross, gospel, done, stop, don't want to hear it anymore. Once you get that figured out, then we can talk about how we can act as a church. But right now, you guys are still confused on that. Because half of you are saying, my faith comes through faith, my faith in Christ comes through the gospel. The other half of you are saying, yes, that's true, but... In Foundation Church, I'll leave you with this. There are absolutely no buts in the gospel, period. That one's done, signed, sealed, delivered on the cross. All right? I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I was joking earlier about Amy and the music, but I did request one song when, when she asked. And, and thinking about this passage that we're going to talk about, which is all about it's Christ. It's Christ only. Right? So I asked them to do um, this song called All I Have is Christ. Is an awesome one. I've played it with, it with them many times. So as we go through this next song, I want you to think about that in your own life. And those of you that are here, some of you are visiting. That's awesome. I'm so glad you're here today. I'd love to meet you afterwards. I'll kind of hang out in the back. Um, but for those of you that are part of the, the core group here at Foundation, we're building this church from the ground up. As we play this last song, I want you to really think about us as a church and you individually within this church. Right? Because if myself and Roy as elders in this church are not very clear... On the gospel period, this church absolutely will be a failure. This church will absolutely fail. We have to be firm right there, right? That's the foundation. And so it's so easy for these little things to creep in, guys, whether it be money or time or family or other ministries. It's easy for it to creep in and all of a sudden become some sort of like qualification for the gospel. But remember when Paul found that out, he's like, guys, you got this all wrong. Stop and turn your eyes back towards Christ. All right, let's do all I have in Christ. Thank you, guys. Thanks, brother. Uh, if you want to stand, you're more than welcome to. If you want to kneel, if you want to stay sitting, whatever it is, your preference. Again, those are not things, those, those uh, legalistic things that we were talking about. There is no prescribed, you must do this or you must do that when you worship. If you want to be down on your face, praising the Lord and giving thanks. That is all you. You do you. Do you. <laughs> in, in that way, not, not follow the world, you know, um, and seek whatever your heart wants to do because our heart is deceitful. But what I'm saying, and getting off the rails here, is that we worship our God and there is no prescribed way here at Foundation Church. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought of you.
anything to it, Foundation Church. All I have is Christ. Amen. Don't insert other things between you and Christ. I'll let you close out, Amen. sister. Thank you.